I request Kani to speak a few words. Respected professors, dear teachers, and my dear colleagues, thank you very much for honoring me in this uh, Tamil Nadu ASG monthly meet. Uh, I am retiring from the government service tomorrow. I was privileged to work as a PG, as an assistant, as an associate professor under various distinguished professors since my undergraduate days. And the Tamil Nadu ISG under uh, Dr. Ubal is doing an excellent job in conducting meetings. And uh, I admire their promptness. <laughs> But that is good. Everything is on time. Everything is apt. Thank you all very much. Kindly pray for my good health and happiness. Thank you very much. And we have stalwarts in our um, uh, forum here. Inflammatory bowel disease has evolved. I remember when I was a student in the Madras Medical College about 40 years ago, Dr. Madhana Gopal, my chief, would say the number of patients who bleed per rectum is the same, both in the West as well as in the East. Only thing is here we know a cause, most probably it's infective, and we don't have patients with inflammatory bowel disease, and most of it is all in the West. But we know the exactly what has happened and evolved in the last 40 years, and we have the equal number of cases, and the evolution of treatment from basic methylamine now to even oral biologics has evolved. And to talk all about that today, in the first speech is evolving trends in inflammatory bowel disease over the past two decades is uh, Dr. Ashwin Anantakrishnan, who is the director of MGH and, and Franz Colitis Center and associate professor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School. He graduated from JIPMA, and I wouldn't like to stand between you and Dr. Ashwin today. May I invite Dr. Ashwin to the dais and to talk to us on the evolu evolving trends in inflammatory bowel disease for the last two decades. Dr. Ashwin, the podium is yours. Thank you.
thank you. I'm uh, really delighted to be here to, to talk on this topic. This, this is an area we've been working on for the, for the past 20 years, and we've really seen uh, a tremendous change in how this disease is managed and with the availability of, of data guiding different things that we're doing. So I'm excited to take you all on this journey over um, how we manage IBD over the past two decades, and I'm actually very interested in hearing your thoughts on how the management here is and how that compares. So IBD is not actually a new disease. The existence of ulcerative colitis has been known since the time of the US Civil War, which was in, in the mid 19th century. And you see here uh, a photomicrograph from 1869 that is from the time of the US Civil War showing the image of what we presume is one of the first cases that was diagnosed as ulcerative colitis. Crohn's disease is also not a new entity, though it's much newer than ulcerative colitis. The first cases of Crohn's disease was, as we know, described from uh, Mount Sinai Hospital in New York around the mid-1920s, where they first described the occurrence of ileal strictures, and so they labeled it regional ileitis, though we now know that it is not exclusive to the small intestine. The present burden of IBD really is a moving target, depends on the data source. At least in the US, the current estimate is that about two to three million individuals have uh, inflammatory bowel disease. It's probably half Crohn's disease, half ulcerative colitis. In Europe, the estimates are about three to four million. And if you look just globally at the number of cases, I'm sure the number of cases in Asia is much higher than in either of those uh, two populations. Even though the frequency of ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease may be very different across different countries, what is uniform or virtually uniform is that there's been a tr significant increase in incidence of these diseases. And so this, this was a paper that was published about 10 years ago that was a systematic review looking at different population-based studies looking at incidence of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And the individual lines and the countries they represent are not themselves important, but you see that almost uniformly, every trend that is looking from the 1960s onwards demonstrates an increase in incidence of both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis uh, across, across different population-based cohorts in the world. Right? Where we have made tremendous advance over the past 20 years is in understanding why ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease Develops. And we know that broadly, if I had to summarize it in one phrase, it would be that it arises because of a dysregulated immune response in a dysbiotic host. But it's actually much more complex than that. We know that genetics is very important for the development of these diseases. We have about 240 different SNPs that have been associated with either Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. We know that the individual effect of each of these SNPs is fairly modest, so that the odds ratio for any given variant is between one and 1.5, really, except for, for the NOT2 locus, which we know, at least in the Western populations, is associated with Crohn's disease. That has an odds ratio of about three, which is the strongest genetic effect that we see for any of these uh, genetic variants. Even with all these different genes put, put together though, we still explain only about 50% of the variation in occurrence of either Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. So still the vast majority of cases remain sort of ununderstood. The second important part that is naturally a consequence of these genetic variants is alteration in your immune function and multiple studies have linked these genetic variants to alterations in either the innate immune response or the adaptive immune response or maintenance of the epithelial barrier, which we recognize is very important in, in preventing the crosstalk between the microbiome and the immune response. We also know more now over the past decade because of the availability of very high quality, high throughput sequencing um, methods that this underlying microbial dysbiosis is fundamental to the development of IBD. And we know that this likely precedes IBD in the vast majority because of studies looking at first degree relatives showing that you start seeing changes in the microbiome that resemble Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, even in healthy first degree relatives who don't have active inflammation. So it's not just a consequence of inflammation, but it is something that starts before. We also know that this is important.